Welcome you this evening. I think we've got most of our audiovisual problems worked out. Um, so uh, I, I want to remind you that uh, we do have a nominating committee for officers for next year. Uh, Patty Marlette, Tom Ewart, uh, and uh, Barbara Gobert. So if you're interested in being on the board or being an officer, talk to them. Otherwise, they may be giving you a call. Uh, after the program tonight, I believe there are refreshments in the classroom. Uh, and Mark Nolan will introduce our speaker. Welcome, everybody. Good to see a nice group out here tonight to learn about these beautiful birds. So tonight we have Bob Gress. Bob Gress is the former director of the Great Plains Nature Center right here and is co-founder of a bird photography website, Birds in Focus. He's photographed wildlife in wild places throughout North America, Central America, South America, New Zealand, and Africa, and probably other places that I'm not aware of. Over 4,900 of his wildlife photographs have been published and seen in a variety of magazines and more than 70 books. Welcome, Bob Gross. Thank you, good evening everybody. And uh, even though I was direct here, all this equipment has changed since I was direct here. <laughs> <laughs> That's my excuse. I'm glad we've got it running here now. Um, and it's, it's good to see the folks here this evening. And in this group, I'm sure we've got uh, people of various backgrounds. I suspect we have photographers here this evening who might be looking at photographs and analyzing foreground and background and composition and lighting. We have birders here, and if you're a birder, you're probably up here looking at these and seeing how many you can identify as you work your way down. And then we also have the non-birders that are here this evening uh, whose brains are already full and are thankful that they don't have to add too much more into their heads. And this evening, uh, we're going to take a look at warblers, but not in the usual sense, because if we were to look up birds in general and look at bird books and bird apps and start learning about birds, we find that birds are organized primarily by their relationships with each other. And most of the bird books concentrate primarily on how to tell one bird from another bird. We look at lots of identification type things. So birders look at things in a unique way. This evening, I'm not going to be talking to the birders and trying to tell you how to identify birds that you already know. I'm not gonna be talking to the photographers and telling people things that you're gonna forget as soon as you leave. And for the rest of you whose brains are already full, uh, you don't need to worry either because this evening I'm gonna to talk to all three groups and we're gonna be looking at not those other things but at some other tidbits that when we walk out of the room this evening, all three of these groups can just forget about everything that we talked about. But I do want you to remember one thing, and that is for many, many, many generations, we have had people thinking about birds, thinking about mammals, thinking about reptiles and amphibians, identifying them, paying attention to what kind of habitats they live in, getting a better feeling and an understanding for life on Earth. We live in a special place. And it's through these naturalists of the past, some of which we're gonna be talking about, that have laid the groundwork for ongoing knowledge. And hopefully everybody that's here, or you wouldn't be here this evening, has some interest in the natural world around us. And we hopefully will maybe be exposed to some bits and pieces of, of thoughts and activities from other people. So one of the things that we know when we're sitting here is that Warblers are kind of colorful birds. They're, they're cool birds, and they live in some really cool places. These photos were collected in Alaska and California, Texas, Colorado, Missouri, Arkansas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, New Mexico, Arizona, and Kansas. And if you notice what's missing here are a lot of the far east coast things, and I haven't really been out there to photograph warblers per se, because a lot of these warblers may be more numerous back there, but we also get them through here. And a lot of the East Coast warblers are kind of worked on up in some breeding grounds up in Michigan and Minnesota and, and uh, Wisconsin. So I photographed all the males of all the species that we have in the U.S. I have not photographed all the females yet. I say yet because there's still time. 
As I mentioned a little while ago, most bird books arrange things by relationships with each other. But this evening, it's my program, so I can arrange them any way I want. And so we're going to start by looking at warblers with some very restricted ranges. Kalima is one of the 31 states that make up Mexico. Kalima warblers have lived primarily in Mexico, but a few migrate north and come across the border to nest in Big Bend National Park. A hike to their only U.S. breeding area requires a 12-mile round trip into the Chisos Mountains, and the trail climbs 1,600 feet to an elevation of a little over 6,000 feet, and this was a lot of effort for a relatively plain-looking warbler, but the scenery and the trail was pretty fantastic. When you get to the boot of the Boot Canyon, which is that inverted rock over there, it looks like an upside-down book or an upside-down boot, uh, you've left the desert behind, which is 6,000 feet lower, and you've moved into an area of oaks and maples and Arizona cypress, and these are the requirements for the breeding area for the Kalima warbler. The total U.S. population is less than 100 birds. It's not an endangered species because this isn't primarily where they live. They primarily live in Mexico, and we just have a little extinction that comes up here. Kirkland's warbler is found only in stands and young, young jack pines in a small area in central Michigan. Uh, it was listed as an endangered species for over 50 years. In 1987, there were 167 total singing males known to exist. It was removed from the endangered species list in 2015, and perhaps 4,500 individuals exist now. And since its recovery, a few nests have also been found up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and a few of them across Lake Michigan over into Wisconsin. And it was named after an amateur naturalist, Dr. Jared Kirtland, who was not only a doctor, but was a politician in Ohio. So here we have a warbler that's found primarily in Michigan, named after an Ohio politician. What's the chances of that happening? <laughs> it's been called the bird of fire because it needs fire to burn jack pines. And that prepares the pine cones for germination. And they use these pines at this particular stage and succession grows them out of that breeding area into more mature trees. And so fire is used as a management tool in order to keep Kirkland warblers around. This is a golden teak warbler. It has a very limited habitat in Texas. It nests only in woodlands dominated by oaks with at least a few mature ash juniper trees. It nests nowhere except in these unique woodlands of the Edwards Plateau region in an area that many of us know as the hill country of Texas. In Texas, they're called ash juniper trees. By the biologists, by, by the locals, they're called cedar trees, which is a different cedar tree, which is also a juniper that we have here in Kansas. The females strip long pieces of bark off of the ash juniper tree, and they use those pieces of bark to make the nest, and that's why they have to have that particular nest component. If it's a stand of pure juniper, the birds don't like it. It needs at least some mature hardwoods in addition to a few ash juniper. It's been on the United States Endangered Species list since 1990, and ironically, the previous Kirtland's warbler that was delisted in 2019, the Kirtland's warbler is rarer than the golden cheek warbler, which is still listed as an endangered species. Why? Um, I have no idea. And I found these birds in Pedernale Falls State Park that we see here. So there are two of me. Well, maybe. Maybe I am rather just one. And well, maybe we don't really know for sure. So back in 1973, the species that that we know today as the yellow rumped warbler were identified then in the bird books by Myrtle Warbler and Audubon's Warbler. And they, they look quite different. Take a look at the head and the color of the throat and you'll see some differences. Birders frequently call them butterbutts because of the color of their rumps. The myrtle is more eastern and is more common warbler that we find in this particular area. And in the winter, it looks like this. When I came to Wichita in 1979, uh, they were rare on Christmas bird counts. And now all of you that help on a Christmas bird count, these are not only not rare, they are expected on every Christmas bird count that we do. In the spring, it sometimes forages like uh, flycatchers by flying out and grabbing insects and going back to the perch. Generally, myrtle warblers are birds found in the eastern portion of Kansas, and generally the Audubon's warbler is found in 
the western part of Kansas, but even in Kansas, Audubons are far more uh, rare than the myrtle warbler and more likely to be seen in the far portions of western Kansas. Both versions have more subtle plumages in the winter, and here you can see the yellow throat of the Audubon's warbler in his uh, winter plumage. The reason for lumping them is they were known to hybridize. Uh, researchers have now led taxonomists to consider splitting them back apart, so watch for that. We may eventually see the Myrtle and the Audubon's warbler return to us again someday, like our old books. In 2022, I spent a month in New Mexico collecting photos of eight of these nine western warblers that breed in the area between essentially the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast. Each is found in a different type of habitat. McGillivray's warbler is the western counterpart, counterpart of the morning warbler that we'll see in a little bit it's found in the, that's found in the east. Uh, if their breeding ranges overlapped like the yellow rumped warbler that we talked about, uh, we would see tremendous interbreeding between these two species that are very closely related, the McGillivrays um, and the morning warbler. John Townsend discovered this species and named it after his doctor fr friend, William Tolmy. And notice the last name referenced in the scientific name down here, Tolmy I. So it was named after him, and then Audubon got involved. And Audubon named the same species for a Scottish ornithologist, William McGillivray. And the communications were not very good in those days. Audubon was French, and he had a reason for naming it for McGillivray. He wanted an English version of Birds of America, a popular book at that time in Europe. Audubon found McGillivray from Scotland and talked him into being the English translator for the book that he needed, and McGillivray was very well known during his day as an ornithologist, but has since faded to pretty much obscurity nowadays. Here's the black-throated gray warbler. Does not have a restricted range, is not named after anyone, and is, well, gray grayish with a, uh, with a black throat. This species is seen in western Kansas, is found over most of New Mexico and west and north over most of the uh, arid American west. It's fairly common and found over most elevations and over most habitats. These warblers seem to love the arid oak woodlands of canyons and slopes. It's mostly winters in Mexico and is found in similar arid woodlands there in the wintertime. Townsend's warblers nest in the Pacific Northwest and from there on up into Alaska. And these are birds of large trees in a steep, rocky country. The, this bird was, has something in, in common with spotted owls and marbled merlets, and that is they, they use old growth forests for breeding habitats. And in addition to habitat loss due to logging and old growth forests, um, they're also somewhat threatened by climate change and the associated uh, change of rainfall associated with climate change. <coughs> The hermit warbler is a Pacific coast bird from Northern California through Washington. It's often found in pines. Its closest relative is the Townsend's warbler. It's, this is the only photograph I have of this species and I plan to get more maybe this summer. And why is it called a hermit's warbler? I could not find that in any reference that I looked at. So who knows? One of my favorite warblers is the striking red-faced warbler. And I think one of the reasons a lot of people like them is that intense red is not found on very many, very many warblers at all. We see it in a few other perching birds, but certainly not in warblers. To see one of these, you have to go to southern Arizona or New Mexico, and it's more of a Mexican species than it is a U.S. bird. They nest in the Sierra Madre Occidental mountain range of northwestern Mexico, and from Mexico, a few of these birds cross part of the Chihuahuan Desert to the mountains. And they could see those mountains in the U.S. from Mexico. And they cross the political boundary that they know nothing about, which is the U.S.-Mexico border. These isolated mountains that they can see from Mexico, uh, we refer to as the Sky Islands of southeastern Arizona and, and New Mexico. Uh, Red-faced warblers only nest at elevations over 6,400 feet, and thus Sky Islands. They only nest up high and they nest on the ground in heavily wooded uh, mountain slopes. 
I photographed these birds north of Silver City, New Mexico, in Iron Creek Campground in the Gila National Forest. Painted red starts are found in the same area and have a very similar story to the red-faced warbler. This is another Mexican warbler that uh, looks to cross to the Sky Islands and migrates over to nest alongside the red-faced warbler. Like the red-faced warbler, it's another high elevation bird that nests on the ground. This one was carrying insects into this nest. And this is their habitat. But shared by painted bunting or painted red starts, uh, red-faced warblers, graces warblers, olive warblers, acorn woodpeckers, and western bluebirds. A neat collection of birds. Why is it called a red start? Well, we'll hear a little bit more about that when we talk about his more, uh, his better known cousin in a little while. So unique among North American songbirds, these three birds, all western warblers, are named after women. Lucy's warbler, Virginia's warbler, and Grace's warbler. And who were Lucy, Virginia, and Grace? These three are the only North American songbirds that were named after women. If, is there a connection? Well, there is a connection, but in spite of that connection, all three of these are found in the arid Southwest. Coincidence? I don't know for sure. Lucy's warbler is the smallest warbler in the United States and is found primarily in mesquite thickets. It's also the only warbler besides prophonotary to nest in a cavity. The previous Lucy's is similar to the Virginia's, except the Virginia has yellow on the chest and a little bit under the tail and on the rump. And this is a very shy bird and is one of the more challenging to find. Unlike Grace's, which is a Western counterpart of the yellow-throated warbler, unlike the Lucy's and the Virginia's, this bird sings confidently out in the open and it's a uh, quite active and usually quite easily seen. So these three birds named after ladies are connected through Spencer Fullerton Baird, who was secretary of the Smithsonian Institution from 1878 to 1887. He's the connection. Dr. William Anderson, a doctor in the U.S. Army, collected natural history items and sent them to, to Spencer Fullerton Baird, that we'll call Smithsonian dude, he asked Baird to name a bird after his wife, Virginia Anderson. So he named then the warbler. Virginia's warbler was named by Spencer Fullerton Baird's, the Smithsonian dude. And yes, he is the same Baird that we honor by Baird Sandpiper and Baird Sparrow. So these guys that named birds did it for quite a little while. Dr. Elliot Coos, another famous ornithologist, was another doctor in the U.S. Army. He was also another collector of birds, and he also sent them to the Smithsonian, to the same Smithsonian, Smithsonian dude. And he wanted something named after Elliot's sister, 18-year-old Grace Darling Coons. So that's how Grace's warbler got its name. Stay with me. <laughs> so Dr. William Cooper, a friend and a contemporary of Spencer Fullerton Baird, or Baird, the Smithsonian dude, he was a zoologist and the founder of the New York Lyceum of Natural History. And as a friend of Baird, he decided to do Baird a great favor by naming the Lucy's Warbler in honor of Baird's daughter, who was Lucy Hunter Baird. Who knows if any of these women gave a hoot about birds <laughs> and whether they even saw the bird that was named after them. In any case, we really should have more women honored by the contributions that they have made to ornithology and especially to the naming of birds. So Spencer Fullerton Baird, Smithsonian dude, had contacts. He had Dr. Anderson, Dr. Cooper, and Dr. Coos. Lucy was the daughter of Baird, and Grace was the 18-year-old sister of the Army doctor, and Virginia was the wife of another Army doctor. We'll have a test on this a little later. <laughs> Seems like most U.S. warblers are found either in the, in the east or the west, but we do have some that are found east and west. But it's the minority of the warblers, which seems a little bit odd. This guy, the Wilson's warbler, can be found from coast to coast. It was named in honor of ornithologist Alexander Wilson, often called the father of North American ornithology. Dr. Wilson also named some warblers, and we'll hear a little bit about some of his really poor attempts at naming birds in a little while. In the early 1800s, Wilson described at least 26 new species. Not all were birds. Some were mammals and fish and plants, in addition to 
to this. He was honored by birds named after him as well, such as Wilson's Warbler, Wilson's Plover, and Wilson's Snipe. So Wilson's, and also Wilson's Fowler Oak were all honoring Alexander Wilson. In addition to nesting in western mountains and nests all the way from Canada to northern Maine, the orange, or to Maine, this is a, is a nationwide nesting bird along with, with this guy, the orange crowned warbler, which may be our most plain warbler of all in a family of mostly colorful characters. It has uh, no bright colors, no wing bars, no tail spots, no bold facial markings. It has no black throat, no stripes on the back, and no bright rump, and all of this plainness makes it shockingly unique as a warbler. Roger Torrey Peterson called this the dingiest of all warblers. And we find it in Kansas during migration. It breeds from Alaska through the Rocky Mountains east of Quebec. It winters in the south from Texas east through North Carolina. And now a few more warblers named after people. After first collected in 1833, the Swainson's warbler disappeared from science for over 50 years. It was found again in 1884. This is the only living warbler in the U.S. with pure white eggs. Birds sitting on the nest are known for their tameness and oftentimes sit so tightly that you can walk up to them and touch them while they're incubating. The species has an odd breeding habitat. Originally, it was known as a bird of swamps and floodplain forests. Then it was found to nest in the Appalachians at elevations up to 3,000 feet. And these populations of these birds are not connected to entirely different types of habitats for the same species. We don't see that very often. John Bachman discovered this species, but Audubon jumped in and named the bird after his friend William, Town or William Swainson, who was an English naturalist. And I wonder what Bachman thought of that. It kind of got stolen from him. Later on, another warbler was named after him, the Bachman's warbler, which proved to be a hybrid. Blackburnian uh, warbler was named after someone in the Blackburnian family, but, but they don't really know for sure who. So, it seems that in the 1700s, Ashton Blackburn sent a study skin to his sister, Anna Blackburn, who was an amateur naturalist in England. She never came to the New World. She never saw the Blackburnian warbler alive, but she liked collecting dead birds from here. Kind of a unique gal. Thomas Pennant saw the bird in Anna's collection. He described it for science and named it the Blackburnian Warbler. Since then, everybody has speculated whether it was actually named for the brother, the collector, or from the collection, the sister. It's suspected it was named after the brother just because that was a male-dominated field at that time. With his fiery red throat, it's one of our more stunning warblers. And he's green on, the green on this one's belly is is most likely coming from leaf reflection from up underneath. On the breeding grounds, uh, we look for them in really tall pine trees where it's found. I think this is the only warbler named after its food, the worm-eating warbler. These are a variety of, of different insects, including worm-like larvae, but uh, rarely or possibly never eats earthworms. They spend a lot of time in clusters of leaves um, where it pokes around in these prime spots as places for larvae to hide. It finds its food and nests in deciduous forests in the eastern portion of the U.S. Interestingly, um, the bird rarely descends to the ground when feeding, but it does almost all of its uh, foraging and, and nesting on the ground. So it doesn't feed on the ground, but it, but it nests on the ground. Not foraging, but just nesting on the ground. The nest of this species is so unusual it was uh, actually named after its nest. Oven birds make a domed nest structure on the ground known as the oven. Uh, the dome is made of woven vegetation. It has a side entrance and is thought to resemble a, a wood-burning cooking oven. And that oven there on the upper left is not my photograph. I've never seen the nest, but most warblers get a, a very different plumage after the breeding season where the oven bird uh, has very little variation between the spring breeding colors and its uh, wintertime colors. Oven birds look and act a lot like uh, thrushes, uh, but where thrushes like the robin hop about, oven birds walk about, one foot, be, one foot at a time. So they, they, they look quite a bit different when they're, when they're moving about. They can be tame, and if you see one and remain motionless, uh, they'll sometimes uh, approach you to within a couple of feet. 
They're loud songsters and they're way more often heard than they are seen. So here's a few eastern warblers named after their habitats. Uh, are palm warblers found in palms? Well, yes they are, or at least part of the time. They spend winters on the Caribbean islands and in Mexico and in the Yucatan Peninsula and the very tip of Florida, all palm country where these birds are found. Despite its tropical sounding name, it's one of the northernmost breeding warblers and it goes well up into the taiga reaches of northern Canada to nest. These warblers are rarely flit about tall trees, but they primarily feed on insects on or near the ground. Are pine warblers found in pines? Well, yes they are. Most of the breeding grounds and the wintering habitats of this bird are filled with pines. They, they winter in southeastern U.S. and they use pines not only in southeastern U.S., but these birds will also then move up into the Great Lakes region and nest in pines from the Great Lakes all the way through the New England states. So it's found in pines and the only time it's not in pines is typically when it's migrating when we find these guys that are oftentimes found in deciduous <laughs> forests when no pines are around during migration. It feeds them much like a, a brown creeper and like nut hatches as it crawls around in the foliage looking for insects. Are prairie warblers found on prairies? Uh, not so much. It does like shrubby areas and old fields and pastures and forests that have had trees killed by diseases and by, by fires and by, by logging. And so as these areas start to grow up, it starts to make good habitat for the prairie warbler. The species is most abundant in the southeastern portions of the U.S. and then it migrates to southern Florida and to the Caribbean islands to spend most of its winter time. Breeding birds survey show this species declining throughout its range. It's listed as a species of greatest conservation need in 17 eastern states. And so this is a bird that's on its way down, probably because of changes in its nesting habitats. Are magnolia warblers found in magnolias? And way off on this one, not, not, not hardly very often at all. Uh, we give Alexander Wilson credit for misnaming this bird he first saw a magnolia warbler in a magnolia tree in Mississippi while it was migrating. So he called it a magnolia warbler. We only have to wonder uh, what it would have been called if it were found in a pine tree in Kansas while it was migrating. <laughs> like many warblers, this one nests in boreal forests of Canada and from the Great Lakes to New England and down the Appalachia Mountains. It winters from southern Mexico through Panama. Magnolia warblers are kind of striking birds. Some birds are named after where they live, although some of these are really poorly named, as we'll see in a moment. Water thrushes don't act like other warblers. They, they get their name because, like many thrushes, they have spots on the chest and they spend their time on the ground near streams, thus water thrushes. The search for food like spotted sandpipers, they walk about the stream edges, their heads bob up and down, they slowly raise and lower their tails. It's the Louisiana water thrush. The Louisiana water thrush is not named after the state, but after the French territory acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. The territory was purchased in 1803. The bird was named in 1808, and in 1812, Louisiana became a state. The northern water thrush is similar in appearance to the previous Louisiana water thrush, and they're kind of challenging to tell apart. The Louisiana water thrush nests along running streams the northern water thrush nests in swampy and boggy forests, usually up on the, on the U.S.-Canada border and farther north. Tennessee warbler, like some others, was named after the state in which the very first specimen was collected. Uh, it does not nest in Tennessee, but was only passing through. And again, we wonder what it would have been called if it had been found passing through Kansas. Another chance for Kansas warbler that we missed. The bird is not very spectacularly colored. Uh, it feeds on insects and berries, but unlike most warblers, it also probes for flowers um, for nectar. And this was actually photographed in High Island, Texas, where the Wichita Audubon Society would be going on a field trip, and those flowers should be blooming in High Island while we're there. 
And like other poorly named birds, this one was also named by Alexander Wilson. This is one of our most common warblers in Kansas during migration. Another poorly named warbler is the Nashville warbler, also named by Alexander Wilson. Again, named because he saw one there as it was migrating up to the boreal forest. The boreal forests of Canada are, are immensely important to most of our eastern warblers. These forests occupy much of northern Canada in that, that region where there are no roadways. So if you look at a map and you see all of that area where no roads extend, that's the boreal forest area and that's the area where a lot of these birds are headed. The bird's closest relative may be the Virginia warbler in the western U.S. Both the Virginia and the Nashville have the little patch of chestnut colored feathers on the back portion of its head and a, a really bold eye ring. Connecticut warblers are famous for being really hard to find uh, in the nesting period. They spend their time in remote muskeg and spruce bogs. Most birders see their life bird usually migrating through a region on its way uh, to and from. Uh, I finally saw my life, my life bird in the Saxim bog in Minnesota, uh, northwest of Duluth. Luckily, I found a couple of birds on their nesting grounds adjacent to the roads and didn't have to slosh through flooded hummocks and spruce bogs to find one. This is a more typical view in a tangle of uh, lichens where they like to hide and skulk about. Well, actually, it's not a very typical view because typically they'd be about two yards farther back into the shade with all of this tangle in front of them. That seems to be where most of them were found. Connecticut warblers are also poorly named by Alexander Wilson. It was first collected in Connecticut as it was passing through. Also named by Wilson, but at least the Kentucky warblers are known to breed in Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky warblers join a handful of others that are more likely to be found on or near the ground rather than in the tree canopy. This uh, helps explain why some ornithologists identify the white-tailed deer as the greatest enemy of the Kentucky warbler because rising deer populations clear out the understory and overgrazing of deer has heavily impacted the, the shrub cover that's needed for nesting warblers. Kentucky warblers are loud and really strong singers and each individual song is unique to that individual but it's different from their neighbor but but similar to most of our hearings. So guess who named the Cape May warbler? <laughs> Alexander Wilson. He named it in 1831 from a specimen collected 20 years earlier by George Ord at Cape May, New Jersey, and it wasn't reported in Cape May again for another 100 years, but it's honored by his name. <coughs> so how many of you have seen this warbler? Neither, neither Alexander Wilson nor John James Audubon saw this warbler alive. And for those of you that have seen it, it's good to know that you have passed these giants in northern mountains. <laughs> like so many warblers, this one also heads to the boreal forests of Canada. It seeks out spruce budworm infestations, and with that, it finds not only a place to nest, but its food source throughout the nesting season. Heading south, it feeds heavily on nectar and fruit juices, probably to get uh, what I would imagine would be a nasty taste of budworms out of your mouth. <laughs> Guess who named the Canada Warbler? You are right if you think Alexander Wilson. At, at least this bird does breed in Canada and it's found there as well as parts of the northern U.S. and down the Appalachian Mountains. Most warblers don't pair up until they reach the breeding grounds, but pairs of these birds have been found together in Central America and they stay together as a pair all the way north during migration up to their breeding grounds, which is a little different for most warblers. Here's a female. They spend less time on the breeding ground than most other species. Uh, Canada warblers uh, arrive late and leave early by the standard set by the other warblers. So here's a, a couple of species that were named for the, the plumage patterns on their head. The morning warbler was named for the male's dark hood. It was thought to resemble a morning veil. Uh, this is a bird that skulks in low, tangled, really dense vegetation. In 18 32, Wilson collected this species out of marsh near Philadelphia. And so I have to wonder why it wasn't called Philadelphia warbler. <laughs> the, the bird Wilson shot was the only morning warbler that he ever saw. 
The hooded warbler is appropriately named for the black hood up over its head. Hooded warblers eat lots of insects and insect grubs. The bristles at the base of the bill may help protect the bird's eyes. It's theorized while well, it, it collects grubs and then bashes them into submission before swallowing it. And they, they think that maybe the grubs, uh, the, the, the rectal things around the eyes might protect his eyes from bashed grubs, I guess. These workers are often uh, obligingly approachable when migrating. Uh, this is the, the male, look at his throat, and here is the female. Warblers uh, do enjoy a good bath. Uh -huh. <coughs> this I didn't know until researching this program about, about the Perula warbler. So, so who made the mistake naming the northern Perula? It's not Wilson. <laughs> This mistake was made, by, was made by none other than Carl Linnaeus, uh, who is known as the father of taxonomy. And he still makes mistakes. Linnaeus was from Sweden, and he created the system that we know as the binomial nomenclature, which uses, it's used in the naming of all sorts of, of plants and birds and mammals and all sorts of living things. And it's a system where we have a, a scientific name, the first part being the genus, the second part, being the species. And, and this is the system by which we know all living things today. In, eight, in 1758, Linnaeus saw this bird as a study skin. He noticed its very tiny size and its very tiny beak, and he thought it was right, related to Euro European tits, which are related to chickadees. So he looked at it and he thought, this is surely related to a chickadee, so he named it Paris Americanus. Paris was a genus of a type of bird that he thought it was, but he was wrong. Today, the bird's scientific name was changed a little bit to Perula Americanus. Paris and Perula are both derived from his original mistake. And then to carry the mistake a little farther along, our northern Perula belongs to the bird family Perulidae. Another reference to the same mistake. And not only is a bird name for a mistake, but the whole family of birds that all of our warblers are included in are included in that same mistake that was originated by taxonomist Carl Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy. For most people, the number one attraction to warblers is their varied colors. People love warblers because they're colorful. The next two species are closely related and are principles in the best known, most intensely studied instances of hybridization between bird species in North America. This is the golden-winged warbler, and this is the blue-winged warbler. Over the last 50 years, ornithologists have known that where these two species overlap, hybridization occurs. The offspring are known by their own names, the Brewster's warbler and the Lawrence's warbler, depending on who the female and who the male was when this hybridization occurred. Not only have hybrids occurred, but other trends have also been noticed in this study. Across the whole nesting range, the golden wings warbler population is declining at the same time that the blue wing warbler's population is increasing. If they overlap, blue wing warblers slowly replace golden wing warblers over a process of about 50 years. Here's a female golden wing warbler. Theories are varied. It's possible that blue wings just outcompete the golden wings to enable one to get a foothold over the other one. But it's also thought that probably the real reason is that specific habitat needs are changing and the golden wing generally prefers an earlier stage of succession. So the golden wing is there earlier and then as succession occurs it is being replaced uh, by its counterpart and these Birds prefer abandoned pastures, shrubby borders, openings in woodlawns, and it must have really thrived during colonial expansion. For the blue-winged, like this female, succession alone seems to favor this particular species, which is probably why it's doing better in the long run. Watching a black and white warbler forage brings to mind brown creepers and nuthatches and woodpeckers. They, they search along tree trunks and limbs and bare branches and like nuthatches, it does not use its tail for support when foraging upside down or head first down a tree branch. With this feeding technique, they are specialists 
after wood boring insects and bark beetles and moths that are hiding in the tree bark. The name Prothonotary has two usages. Uh, one refers to a position in the Vatican. Um, people in that position wore golden vestments. Another references a notary in the 7th to the 10th centuries in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where supposedly they also wore golden robes. No one seems to know who named this bird. It is a bird of southern swamps, and it's kind of mind-boggling to think that somebody in those southern swamps knew enough about either one of those things to name the Prothonotary Warbler after them. <coughs> this Warbler kind of picked public curiosity during the, the espionage case of Alger Hiss from 1948 to 1950. A former communist named Whitaker Chambers testified that he engaged in espionage against the United States during World War II. Hiss denied he even knew Chambers, but Chambers said it was Hiss. In private hearings, Chambers revealed that he knew Hiss, and he knew that Hiss was a bird watcher. And he had once bragged about seeing a prothonotary warbler in D.C. along the Potomac River. Later, in a, a, a assuming a nationally televised hearing, a leading California congressman asked him, what hobby, if any, do you have, Mr. Hiss? Hiss answered his hobbies were tennis and bird watching, unknowing what Congressman John McDowell, or unknowing what he had revealed earlier in a, in a private session. So Congressman John McDowell then jumped in and he said, have you ever seen a prothonotary warbler? And Hiss fell into the trap and he responded, I have, right here on the Potomac. And that kind of proved the relationship between those two men. It convinced the, uh, the people that, that he was indeed known uh, to his accuser. And the committee members were convinced that Hiss was lying. I'd like to point out, Mr. Chairman, and this was, this was the response from, uh, let me back this up, from Mr. John McDowell. He said, I'd like to point out, Mr. Chairman, that to discover a rare bird or an unusual bird is a great discovery in life and as an amateur, uh, in the life of an amateur ornithologist. You can usually recall almost everything around it. It's like winning the, the ball game or the yacht regatta. You can recall the time of day, how high the sun was, and all the other things. So the rest of the story, the, the prodding California congressman who pushed hard and and kind of received some sudden name, some sudden name and recognition and some fame from this televised hearing was selected by General Dwight Eisenhower as his 1952 running mate and eventually became President Richard Nixon in 1969. <laughs> witchity, 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 witchity. The common yellow throat is heard from coast to coast and throughout much of North America. This is our most widely distributed warbler. Cattail marshes, bogs, sedge meadows, roadside ditches, lake edges, grassy streams, and about any moist area may support this songster. Males are acrobatic songsters and sing to establish their territories and to attract the females who build her nest alone while this guy is over here showing off. Have you ever looked at American Red Start and wondered how it got its name? The word Red Start comes from an old German word meaning roster, meaning red tail. The word is roster, meaning red tail. It, it constantly flicks its tail open and closed like a fan while foraging. And actually, um, the red star has, a, has orange rather than red. And the female has yellow rather than red as well. So again, probably not the best name for the bird. During spring migration, the redness of the males intensifies and birds with the brighter colors are better at holding prime territory than their less colorful males. Cerulean warbler is a name for the blue color. Cerulean blue is a close shade to, to sky blue. No other North American warbler has a, this particular shade of blue. Species were named by Alexander Wilson. It's good to know he got one right. <laughs> The canopy uh, walkway in High Island, where which the Audubon is going to be going before long, um, is a good place for seeing uh, cerulean warblers. The bay-breasted warbler spends its winters in northern South America. Uh, the U.S. is mostly pass-through country on its way up to Canada's boreal forest. I photographed 
these were a little small dip of the boreal forest extends into Minnesota. Uh, it's northeast of Duluth, and if you get within 40 miles of Canada, Canada, you're in the right area for these birds. I regularly hear yellow warblers singing loudly every spring. They, they love willows and are showy and not afraid of being out in the open. In the wild, I've, I've never seen their red stripes. I'm red colorblind, and only on photographs when I can bring them up on a monitor, then I can finally get it large enough where I can see that, yes, that is red, by the way, so that's pretty magnificent. All warblers are, are victims of brown-headed cowbirds who lay eggs in nests of other species. Uh, the yellow warbler may be the most targeted by all of the by all of the other warblers, uh, by the cowbirds. Some yellows will tolerate the new egg, but others then, as soon as they see a cowbird egg, will build a, a new floor to their nest and continue to lay their own eggs while the cowbird adds to them. And then there are many records of two, three, four, five, and even a six-story nest where they just keep burying the cowbird eggs as the cowbirds keep laying eggs in their nest. With relatively long tail and wings drooping, the profile of chestnut sided warbler is kind of unique. No other bird holds himself quite like that in the warbler world. Because of forest clearing in the 1800s, this species underwent a really spectacular increase in range and abundance. It, uh, up the Appalachian Mountains and now from the Great Lakes into southern Canada, it's a, it's a very prolific nester. Notice the uh, scientific name, Pennsylvania. Looks like somebody misspelled Pennsylvania. Uh, back to uh, Linnaeus, our father of taxonomy from Sweden. He didn't really know English very well, tried to spell Philadelphia the best he could, and that's as close as he got. And the name stuck. The tiny black pole warbler has a reputation for being one of the greatest travelers of all land birds, of all land birds. Not to, we're not talking about peregrine falcons and, and arctic terns, but among land birds, the black pole has a, has a minimum migration route that is never less than 5,000 miles uh, round trip. And from those birds that are in Brazil that nest up in northern Alaska, they have a, a round trip annual migration of over 10,000 miles. And I photographed these birds in Alaska. The normal people, their song is, is more high pitched than any other warbler. Uh, humans only hear a, a fraction of their whole song or and people like me with increasing hearing problems probably hear none of that song. Black-throated blue warblers are all, always a great warbler to find anywhere in the Great Plains. In 2021, I was photographing warblers in Minnesota, but I had no photos of this species at all in 2021. From eBird reports uh, and from the Minnesota Birding Guide, I found that Oberg Mountain was claimed to be the best place in the state for nesting black-throated blue warblers. Uh, so from the parking area up the mountain and around the loop was a three mile loop. I, I went up early in the morning, I heard five or six singing males, but the fog was just dense and I never even saw one of the birds that I heard. So for lunch, I hiked back down to the parking lot, I ate and then three miles back up the mountain, hiked around, this time the sun was harsh and just ugly. And I saw a few birds, but I didn't like what I was seeing. So back to the parking lot, I went to town for gas and supplies. At 4.30 I was back, went back up to the top of the mountain again, hiked through the area, and I had found this, uh, this pine snag, and it offered some pretty nice light. And so after nine miles up and down, uh, these were the best images I got that day. No warbler except the black and white warbler compares in ability to forage upside down on vertical surfaces more so than, than the yellow-throated warbler. Mark Gatesby, the bird artist who came to the U.S. in 1710, he called the bird he painted a, a yellow-throated creeper because of its walking behavior. This is, the, this is a, a warbler that's uh, mostly from the southeastern part of the United States where they love to nest in Spanish moss. Uh, in eastern Kansas, they are strongly associated with sycamore trees. And there are several subspecies of this warbler, and these subspecies that's found in Kansas is historically known as the sycamore warbler because of the habitat that it nests in. When I was a college student at Emporia State, I took a, a spring ornithology class, and on one uh, field trip, we found a small group of black-throated green warblers. They were on the Neosho River, right on the north edge of campus, and I was kind of hooked. I thought, that is one cool-looking bird. I, I kind of credit this warbler along with cedar waxlings for making me kind of interested in birds, and 
I wanted to know more about them. I wanted to know what they were and where they were going and where they came from and what they ate and where they nested. And that summer I purchased my first camera and decided I wanted to be a wildlife photographer and ran around chasing birds and mammals and still do. I'm still chasing them with the camera and I'm still learning about birds and I, I, I thank you Mr. Mr. Warbler for that. Some birds flunked out of Warbler School. So these are the last ones that we're going to look at. And all of my old bird books put the yellow-breasted chap with the warblers. And for everybody that had seen a bunch of warblers, you look at this guy and you thought, why in the world is that a warbler? It doesn't look anything like a warbler. It's twice the size of the largest warbler, and it has a different shaped bill, and there are other differences as well. And, and nobody seemed really to know what to do with this bird or how to classify it. And in 2017, the American Ornithological Society moved this chap to its own family. And its placement was probably well deserved. It, it was finally sort of resolved. It's in this new family, but it is the only member of its family. It has no other relatives that they can identify this chap being closely related to. The Arctic warbler is an old world warbler. It's not related to our wood warblers at all. It, it nests in the taiga of, primarily of Asia, and it crosses the Bering Strait into Alaska, where it also nests. In winter, it lives primarily in the Southeast Asia area. This is the uh, smallest member of the leaf warbler family in Asia, and a bird that's not related to our warblers at all. And this poor guy got kicked clear out of the family as well. Even though it's, it's still called a warbler, DNA analysis showed it's not related to other warblers. So the olive warbler just plain got kicked out. This bird is primarily a Mexican species. It's, it's now also in a family all by itself with other, no other known relatives. Um, it's found in the mountains of, of southern Arizona and New Mexico, only in pines, and oftentimes these pines are infected with mistletoe that you see here. We found them primarily at elevations over 6,000 feet uh, by looking for the mistletoe. And when we found the mistletoe, we got out and we started looking for the warblers and found them there. So these guys uh, live in the same area as the, um, as the uh, uh, the red start and the uh, red faced warbler. In 1998, the American Ornithological Union moved this bird into its old family, and that's it. Clear over there on the right. And Patty, would you tell us how that's pronounced? <laughs> yeah, good luck. And then there's this guy, and and this is the last warbler we're going to look at, and this guy is entirely gone. Uh, Bachman's warbler was a bird of our U.S. southeastern swamps. Uh, some authorities accept this Louisiana photograph that was taken in 1988 as the, the very last sighting. But if you look through enough of these photographs, you'll see that the photo is credited to two different people. And there's a little suspicion about what this bird actually is and whether it really was the last Bachman's warbler photograph. But, the last fully accepted sighting dates back into the 1960s. Here's what Bachman's warblers look like today. Habitat destruction is listed as its reason for extinction. And this photo reminds us that um, we all need to be conservationists as well as bird watchers. And so with that, I'll have the lights flip back on and we'll see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> I'm thankful that we finally got the computer working. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Well, I really like it when <clears throat> bird, common names of birds say something about the bird. That makes it easier for me. But if you're going to kick the olive warbler out, don't you think you ought to change its name? Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion now about uh, about renaming a lot of birds and, and trying to go to a system where no birds are named after people, which most of us, you know, they, we hear swains. We hear these guys' names or women's names. We don't know who they are. Uh, 
and I'm, I'm not exactly sure how much honor it gives them. It's just rote memory for us that remember that the name of this bird is named, has this silly name. But you know that those are, that are the red-faced warblers and the black-throated greens and the cerulean. Uh, there is something to be said for learning birds whose name actually reflects something about the birds. So it, it is kind of a movement, and it's kind of intensified during this period of being politically correct. Now, whether or not any changes will happen, I don't know, but it's certainly being discussed. Yes? Talk about the habitat up in Canada being kind of protected while they run out of roads. Mm -hmm. What's the southern part look like? You said in the Caribbean, northern uh, uh, South America. What, what's the where, southern, the, where the habitat is down yeah, there? You know, every species is a little bit doing as far as Survival. Yeah, every species is a little bit different, and, and that's the that's kind of the interest. That's a fascinating part about warblers and about birds is that every species seems to have its own areas that it goes to nest, looking for specific traits, and then you go down into uh, Mexico and Central America and South America, and there are certain regions where a lot of those birds go to spend the winter time. Some of them associate with warblers that they don't see during the summertime. Others kind of go to similar areas, but they go back to the same areas year after year after year. And there is a migration memory about that, but there is also available food that they as an individual species are capable of taking advantage of. But if you try to take a look at a similarity between up there and down south, there's not much. There's not much similarity at all. It's, it, it's entirely different. But it works for each individual species. Yes? Two questions. First one is, what's the size range? You know, like the smallest are the warblers and then the larger? What's the range? Mm -hmm. Well, I will show you, which is easier than telling you. Okay. The smallest ones are about this big. The largest ones are about that big. <laughs> so, so small. I mean, they're all little dinky birds. Okay. They're all birds that love the upper canopy or the dense brushy areas down in the bottom. The trick in photographing them is getting out in the open. And if you see a program like this and all the birds are out in the open, that's not the way you see them in the wild. But who wants to look at a bunch of twigs with just an eyeball looking out <laughs> behind them? And so like you, I kind of select for birds where you, pictures where you can actually see the birds. So my second question is, around here, right here in our area, Will we be more likely to see them in the countryside, or are they city birds? Good question. Where are we likely to see them around here? Birders in the Wichita area uh, that want to go to a public area to see them concentrate on Oak Park down in Wichita. Uh, big mature trees, high canopy, large trees. The leaves are budding out. The insects are coming out. But it's that kind of habitat, even in backyards up and down the Ark River where they're found, uh, in, in parks all the way across the state, look for, for big trees for most of those warblers. But then you run into things like uh, the common yellowthroat, which is a bird of cattail marshes. And we find them, if you have a big stand of cattails, you're gonna have, you're gonna have common yellowthroats there. And so uh, there are certain areas to look for them. You get up into the breeding grounds and there are certain birds that you find in pines. Uh, I, when I was up there uh, a couple years ago, I spent some time looking for Blackburnian warblers, and I kept going to places that I thought Blackburnian warblers would be found. And I found this one, this one guy, and uh, he and I were were both photographing uh, pine warblers. And and he said, uh, "What else are you looking for?" And I said, "Well, I keep striking out on Blackburnian. Now, they're supposed to be fairly common here." And he said go to the denser stand of pines. If pines are not there, you're not gonna find any Blackburnian. And so, you know, birders know these little quirky things about identification. And if you, if you live in an area, like the birders of Kansas know about where to find the Kansas breeding birds and what kind of habitats they find them. And if you go to California or to Arizona or Minnesota, the same is true up there. So oftentimes when we're looking for birds in certain areas, find somebody with binoculars or a big camera and and go talk to them. And you'll oftentimes find out things that none of the bird books or none of the bird apps that you have on your phone might tell you. Any other questions? Yes? Stupid question. Love the pictures. 
Why are some of them having pink or very light colored legs and most of the rest of them are black? I really kind of find that favorable. Of, of, did you say legs? Legs. I have no clue. <laughs> I wouldn't know who else to ask. I don't know. I don't know. Why do some have different colored I, I, legs? Your pictures, at least you know. can see that on. I can't see that mm -hmm. on one of the things. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. I may have to do another program on the leg color dispersion. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect very many people there, but I might try that. <laughs> I don't know. Good question. You know, it's a pigment there's thing, a just lot like of questions pets. about birds where uh -huh. the most accurate thing you can say is, I don't know. And that's why we keep learning. If you don't know, I'm in trouble. So. <laughs> uh, I will make an announcement. Um, Pete Jansen's back there in the back. Pete and I are, are, are working towards uh, a revision of, of your book, The Guide to Kansas Birds and Birding Hotspots, and she wants autographs, by the way, Pete. And uh, this book will have uh, turned into the press uh, by the end of the year, and then it goes through design and layout and whatever, and it'll probably be coming out towards the end of 2024, is my guess, although we don't know exactly when it's gonna come out. But, but uh, Pete is hard at work on expanding the hotspot section. He travels all over the state, uh, county listing and knows the ins and outs of, of places in every county and um, he's moved the hotspots list which what have we got about about 20 of them in there to the, the new book will have a, probably a few more than 100 uh, hotspots in the book uh, the bird photographs are about 360 or so there and the new book will have about 575 uh, we're going to show a lot more uh, nuances and specialties of plumage and more males and females and more winter and more breeding and a lot more diversity of stuff and and it's uh, bound to be a bigger book because of that and so watch for it it'll be coming out we think in in probably late 2024 and it'll be called the guide to kansas birds and birding hotspots expanded edition so it's coming uh, I also put out a, uh, a photo blast periodically when I go somewhere, and uh, many of you are on that, I know. But if, if you do not get the photo blast and would just like to get those emails periodically, I have a little folder up here, and there's also some business cards up here. And if you just give me your email address, I'll be glad to just send you one of those uh, after one of those trips. I just sent out one. The most recent one was on the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Uh, and so th those come out whenever I feel like doing them whenever I've been somewhere. So with that, thank you for being a really good group. Thank you.